Our next speaker is uh, Jordana Bergman. Uh, she's an, aqua an aquatic ecologist um, and uh, a conservation scientist. Um, in any uh, fight, you need soldiers, um, and I would call her a soldier of uh, the natural world. Um, she doesn't focus specifically on muskies. She is concerned uh, in the water health in its entirety. Um, she's doing her PhD thesis right now on um, fish connectivity, looking at uh, fish through the Rito uh, lock system. And um, she's going to tell you more about it because I'm um, the specialist and she's the one working hard at it. But she's, uh, she's you know, worked around the world. She's uh, a professional scientific diver. She's the one in the trenches. She's the one down there in the dive suits, setting up and getting readings and, uh, and, and really um, dedicating herself uh, in whole to, um, to her research. And I'm assuming we'll have her uh, PhD and be a doctor soon enough, hopefully, though that does take a very long time. She's uh, um, uh, does acoustic telemetry and, uh, and other um, efforts to support conservation uh, on our waterways and we're very fortunate that muskies are included in her project um, and we stand to learn a lot. Um, I think she's going to give you some pretty inspiring uh, or at least impressive numbers in terms of uh, what they're seeing um, in terms of the number of fish that she's handled or, or tracked and she's also going to tell us a little bit about um, uh, gobies and, and other invasive species and what she's doing because she's tracking both them and the various natural species. Anyways, uh, I want to say thank you, Jordana, for joining us. And uh, without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to pass it over to you. Hopefully, I didn't make too many mistakes there. You're all you're all good, Danny. I'm not Jordy. Uh, no, Jordy's, not at all. no, no, Jordy's coming. Jordy's coming next. So you, uh, you, I don't need any introduction for 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 my part. Jordy and I are tag teaming this presentation. So. Uh, I, I'm, that's okay. It's all good. It's all good. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit just to kind of set up Jordy's presentation and then we'll hand it over to Jordy who is doing all the major heavy lifting on the, the Rideau River uh, telemetry project, um, which is turning out to be a pretty long-term project um, uh, given, given some of the really cool technology that we're, we're using in, in the project. So um, yeah, yeah, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and and do the little preamble, I guess, for about half the presentation, and then we'll turn it over to Jordy. How's that sound? Um, I'm all I'm all ears. I love hearing you speak. Awesome. All right. Yeah, some of you might be pretty uh, sick and tired of me, but I'll, I'm I'm going to try and and make this relatively short. So, Lisa, if you want to go ahead and oh wait, no, do I need to share my screen? I think I need to share my screen. There we go. All right, go ahead, Lisa. You can throw that up there now. All right. Okay, so we're going to talk about some themes in, in musky research. I absolutely do not have time to go into all the many different themes that we could possibly uh, discuss relative to muskies and, and, and the different kinds of research avenues that we could take to study their biology and, and ecology. Um, but I will talk about some that uh, will hopefully set up uh, Jordana's uh, talk. Uh, I love this picture just more or less as, as a, you know, just a cool shot that shows researchers in action. Uh, this was uh, a project on the St. John River uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, there was a group there at uh, the University of New Brunswick, Fredericton. Um, they were looking at musky diets on that system to see if they were eating any uh, salmon smolts. Um, or uh, or any any other um, uh, species of, of particular interest, and I'm finding they don't eat salmon smolts there. But uh, you know, it's through dedicated work of researchers to help answer some of these questions that uh, will enable us to uh, further our understanding of their biology and ecology, but also to inform management uh, as well. And, and that fishery right uh, right now is currently in the process of you know hopefully being a little more recognized as a, as a viable sport fishery. Okay, so um, let me get my going here. Okay, so I want to say, of course, to state the obvious, that there'd be no musky fishing without muskies, um, and and I'll talk about in just a second what I what I really mean uh, by that. Um, muskies are exceedingly rare. Okay, uh, to give you an idea of how many muskies you might reasonably expect in 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 a given system. Of course, this varies wildly. I just read uh, a paper recently that, that's yet to come out that had some very high densities uh, in a particular 
uh, body of water in the states. But you know, generally speaking, in your naturally reproducing populations in muskies, you're probably looking at about one fish for every about five acres of water. Um, they're a rare fish. Uh, they, uh, you know, struggle at the at the early life stages to, you know, go from from egg to adult. Um, there's something critical happening in those early life stages that uh, that just don't set them up well for for strong uh, strong uh, population sizes. So, you know, muskies are exceedingly rare, and and because of that, uh, they can be difficult to study. Um, and, but rare fish really requires science-based management, not belief-based management. We need to be making uh, management decisions that are grounded in empirical evidence, grounded in science, uh, that have appropriate regulations, uh, and that use, again, use research to inform both of those, to inform how we approach their management, and then what kinds of regulations are, uh, are, are set in place uh, to help manage and conserve uh, their populations. Um, you know, muskies are, they're precarious, as I sort of said, uh, uh, in a precarious position. As I sort of said a minute ago, at the early life stages, muskies have a lot going against them. Um, you know, some populations right now are, are doing quite well. You know, uh, John spoke a minute ago about uh, fish on the Ottawa River. And, you know, the Ottawa River population of muskies seems to be, you know, by all accounts, very stable and, and, and pretty strong. Same with the Rideau River system. But, of course, there are other systems where... Uh, the, the populations aren't doing particularly well, including the upper St. Lawrence River uh, in the, in the Gananoque Thousand Islands area. Um, you know, I think in some cases when, when we see populations starting to decline, you know, people start shouting, we need to stock, we need to stock, we need to stock. Well, you know, stocking is not a panacea, okay? It is not, it is not the solution to every problem uh, in, in fisheries, um, and nor should it be. Uh, you know, there's a there's a whole range of reasons we might not want to stock. Um, you know, one of them might be cost. Okay, you start a stocking program, but you know that stocking program isn't necessarily something that's going to be that's going to continue in perpetuity. We see this, you know, time and time again where programs have to end um, because you know maybe they've met a management objective or it's just a cost thing. So you know, we we look at Mille Lacs. Uh, in Minnesota, there was a heyday of, of, of that fishery in like the late 90s, you know, early 2000s, uh, and eventually the stocking stopped there. Um, and, you know, that fishery now is very low density um, and it's not what it once was. And that was in large part because we stopped stocking fish. There's still a population of self-sustaining, uh, naturally reproducing fish there. Um, but, you know, times change and, and things have to uh uh, things have to change with it. Uh, there's other difference in, differences in fisheries objectives or ideologies. So, for example, one of the main things that I see as being very different in Canada versus the United States in terms of uh, Canadian fisheries agencies' approaches to, uh, particularly to musky, musky fisheries, uh, there's not a reliance on stocking here. Very few water bodies get stocked with muskies. In fact, uh, right now, I'm not sure if there might be one body of water that's, that gets stocked with muskies at this point. Uh, but that's about it. So, if we're going to be uh, if we're going to be trying to manage self-sustaining populations, you know, and I think in a lot of cases uh, a stocking program begins with the uh, idea of or the hope of creating a self-sustaining population. Um, but there's lots of research questions that are that that we could be asking to help us figure out how better to manage these self-sustaining populations. Whether you're trying to get one going through stocking or you're trying to manage a currently self-sustaining uh, population of, of fish. Uh, so we need to look at kind of what the information needs are out there. And, and these will vary depending on location. Um, for example, uh, Kentucky versus Ontario might have very different uh, fisheries objectives and, and information needs. There's different issues that, uh, that, face, uh, that, that Kentucky muskies might face that Ontario muskies don't. Um, or even, you know, states that are relatively close, uh, Minnesota versus Wisconsin. You know, there may be different information needs in, uh, in Minnesota that, that Wisconsin either has a, a good grass spot in their fisheries uh, or the same, or there's issues in Wisconsin that, that aren't, uh, uh, or in Minnesota that aren't faced in Wisconsin. So there's going to be differences in, in information needs and again, management strategies. So, you know, the, the types of information that we might want 
in fisheries that are largely sustained through stocking, for example, in my home state of Illinois, um, you know, the, the information needs there might be different uh, in, in, say, a, in, a, in a place like Ontario, where we rely a lot more on natural reproduction. So there may be more uh, research needed into stocking practices and, and culturing stra uh, tactics and, uh, and, and, other, and other stocking strategies. Right? Um, <clears throat> at its very most basic, you know, fish really, all fish really need habitat um, and food. And they need mates. If we're going to have self, if we're going to have self-sustaining populations of fish, fish need other fish to spawn with. Uh, so you know we need to be ensuring that we've got the necessary habitat uh, that not only promotes food sources for those uh, for muskies, but also promotes um, you know the sustainability of of muskie populations through supporting spawning habitat. Uh, and 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 other feeding habitat that you know will promote survival. So um, at its most basic, though, uh, you know those are kind of the three things that that they definitely need. Uh, and and um, uh, habitat, I bolded and uh, all caps there uh, because it is so fundamentally important uh, to fish populations globally, not just muskies. Uh, some major themes in, in muskie research um, that uh, that lots of researchers try to address to you know to varying degrees and and uh, uh, you know with slightly different approaches um, habitat and understanding the, the habitat habitat needs from a spawning perspective uh, the nursery habitats again going back to my comment earlier about how critical those that survival is at those early life stages. Uh, especially in those those nursery habitats, um, human disturbance. So you know, there's lots of issues with uh, with shoreline alterations, uh, erosion. Um, you know, uh, coastal development, shoreline development. Uh, all of these things can potentially lead to uh, disturbances uh, in in spawning habitat, nursery habitat, and, and that, those kinds of things. Another, you know, kind of element of human disturbance too is invasive species, uh, and particularly the introduction of invasive species. So, you know, for example, there's now lots of concern uh, about round gobies on the St. Lawrence River. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, and then Jordi uh, will uh, will talk more about round goby research uh, that she's conducting here in the Rideau system uh, around Ottawa. And connectivity issues. Connectivity is an interesting one because it, it doesn't just mean dams. Um, when we think about ha habitat connectivity and uh, and and um, uh, or lack thereof, we often think of dams as barriers to movement. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, right? That that could also be uh, fluctuations in water levels. But there's also you know more things that we could study too, right? Genetics exploitation uh, and selective harvest. Uh, disease, so things like you know viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus, um, something that really ravaged uh, a lot of musky populations, a lot of uh, historically very important musky populations in, in North America, and and diets, right? And what are they eating, and, and when are they eating different prey items, and um, and and then that kind of thing. That's all. That's always been a, a popular area of study with muskies. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about uh, those those last four there. So spawning habitat. So we know that muskies re revisit the same spawning sites over and over again. Uh, they're very faithful to those same locations, uh, returning to them year after year. Uh, they tend to spawn mostly in shallow water. They need vegetation uh, or sometimes wood. There's there's research that indicates um, that wood, especially in, uh, I think that some of that research is coming out of Wisconsin, um, that wood is, is really important for, uh, for muskie spawning. Um, and so, you know, things like your marshes and, and your, your wetlands, your backwater areas, uh, your back channels on, on rivers and, and uh, back bays and, and lakes, those are all really important areas. Um, there needs to also be ample oxygen close to the bottom uh, because, as you can see, that, that paired up, uh, that pair of muskies there um, swimming along the shoreline, they just deposit their eggs and the male deposits um, his, his milk, sperm, and uh, away they go. And they don't bother uh, protecting the eggs. So some questions, you know, to, to be asked here would be like, what kind of micro habitats? We know broadly where they go and spawn, but what are the specific things that they might be choosing um, uh, in, in a particular site to spawn in? And, and what sorts of factors uh, are associated with successful spawning from a habitat perspective? Um, what about tributaries too? You know, um, uh, there, there's evidence to suggest that muskies will move quite a distance, including 
um, it, you know, going to bays within lakes and, and whatnot, but also going uh, and, and rivers as well, but also going into tributaries. And so, you know, Green Bay is a good example of muskies, um, you know, viable population, very great, awesome population. Doug Wegner is going to talk about that in, in a little bit, I'm sure, uh, of muskies in the bay proper. But they're also, you know, known to go down into the Fox River and go into the Menominee River, uh, both tributaries uh, of, of Green Bay, and, and, and they'll go up there with the express purpose of, of spawning. So how important are tributaries uh, to spawning muskies and juveniles? And, and are some of these areas within the tributaries um, possibly uh, areas to prioritize for habitat restoration? And what about juvenile habitat? Again, going back to my earlier comments, which I've now said multiple times about how critical those early life stages are for muskies, you know, we need to have a good handle on, on what habitat characteristics promote uh, survival of juveniles. So, you know, um, uh, typically you're going to find juveniles in uh, highly vegetated areas with lots of cover, provide, you know, provides protection from predators. Um, we need to ensure that these areas uh, offer the juveniles and, and the babies ample food sources at the time of, of, of hatching and once they absorb the yolk sacs uh, they can then move into uh, you know freely feeding on, on other organisms uh, in, in the area and uh, you know these areas should, should have again kind of low predator burden or at least ample cover to protect them from uh, from lots of predators so questions to be asked here what habitat characteristics are favored by uh, by juveniles certainly there's been a, uh, been some work that's gone into this. Um, you know, but again, some of these habitat characteristics, uh, we might have a good sense of broad, uh, broad scale kind of macro level, um, but what about the micro level uh, habitat characteristics? So um, I'm excited to see, see, you know, future research on this topic. Um, how and when uh, does habitat preference shift from juvenile to adult? You know, what sorts of habitats are they using in those kind of in-between phases, maybe say sub-adults as they move into adults? So my work has shown that they're much more active uh, at the, you know, um, at when those, when they're a bit smaller, um, you know, smaller ad adult size, but what about that sub-adult phase? Are they using different habitats and, and when does that, when does that shift tend to, uh, occur? These are some potential questions that we could ask. And again, habitat connectivity. So, you know, we know muskies are very faithful to their same spawning sites year after year after year. So what do things like, you know, dams, whether they're large and small, uh, large or small, uh, what do culverts, um, uh, what kinds of uh, barriers do things like culverts pose? Um, here's a musky jumping over the Wingra Dam. I think there's a video screenshot from a video that came uh, out recently by Today's Angler. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've read comments online where people said I've spent hours and hours and hours seeing muskies jump and jump and jump and very few of them get over even a relatively small uh, dam like that. Um, definitely in that video, you do see them get over the dam. So it's not that they can't, um, but but maybe not all of them can get over uh, that dam and get into spawning habitat that they want to uh, enter into. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, habitat connectivity is more than just dams and and uh, and other barriers, but also be water level fluctuations. So if, you know, water levels drop too much. Now you might ex you might have a, a shallow um, you know connecting point uh, between two areas that is above water. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's now preventing fish from, from going into these, uh, these other areas. And so this is especially a concern um, during, uh, during spring. If we don't have enough rain uh, or we don't have enough snow, uh, snowpack over the winter, such that in the spring when all that snow melts, the water levels don't rise enough uh, to flood those backwater areas. If, if those habitats are cut off, what happens to the muskies? Um, that's a picture of, of locks on the Rideau River, where the Rideau River actually enters uh, into the Ottawa River. And so Jordana will talk a little bit more about uh, about the importance of locks and some of her uh, work on uh, on muskies and, and other fish movement in the Rideau River relative to those structures. Um, habitat disturbance and invasive species. Um, so loss of spawning and nursery habitat is, um, you know, by far one of the biggest threats to musky populations in, uh, across uh, North America. Um, and so, you know, we need to be uh, cognizant of that and, and trying to restore habitats where we can. But, you know, we can only restore, uh, restoration efforts only really work uh, if we know what to restore, right? And so that goes back to understanding more about the specific habitat characteristics 
uh, that uh, you know seem to promote, promote successful uh, reproduction and survival at those early life stages. Uh, you know, there's also uh, issues with uh, with species introductions um, by uh, at, at the hands of, of humans. Um, so you know, northern pike big issue now in the Kawarthas. Um, uh, they they used to not be there, but uh, have eventually made their way in there. In part, maybe facilitated by the Trent Severn, Severn Waterway, which is a series of locks and dams, and those fish have, have just made their way into the system. Um, now, you know, you start to anglers are starting to notice decreased catch rates, uh, as, and as a as a consequence, um, uh, more hybrid, uh, and maybe as a consequence of northern pike getting into that system, more hybridization. Uh, and certainly catching a lot more, uh, a lot more pike. Round gobies, as I mentioned earlier, in the St. Lawrence River, definitely a concern there. They are known to eat uh, eggs of uh, of different fish species, um, so there's some concern there that uh, their presence may be uh, uh, hampering musky populations from, say, recovering post uh, VHS outbreak in in the late 2000s. Um, rusty crayfish, you know, it's another one in uh, Lake of the Woods. I I, I fish. I fished Lake of the Woods, um, you know, for for many summers over the years, and uh, you know, once upon a time, you could go into a a, a bay and and uh, be fishing a great cabbage bed, and and then over time, that cabbage bed has just receded and receded and receded thanks to uh, uh, explosions of rusty crayfish populations within that lake. And so, you know, what are, what impact may may they potentially be having on on say musky reproduction? It kind of remains a little bit unclear at, at this point. So the Rideau River really, to me, is like the perfect study site um, because it kind of has all the problems. It's got habitat degradation. There's lots of development uh, along the Rideau, um, particularly in this one section that, that Jordan is going to, to talk about in a minute. Um, there's you know issues relative to erosion. Um, you know, lots of silt in the water is uh, perhaps not a good thing for muskies, especially since they aren't taking care of the eggs, and so silt may get onto the eggs and and essentially cover them. Uh, and uh, the muskies aren't there to, to sweep that stuff away. Uh, there's issues related to invasive species. Now this is a relatively new issue in the system, um, but we should be understanding a little bit of, at least about how gobies are moving in the system uh, to maybe get a, a sense of um, uh, what kind of threat they may have on musky populations in the future. Um, and then connectivity, again, you know, being able to move freely among these habitats within the system um, is uh, is an important issue, and, and that may be impeded by all the locks and dams that are on the Rideau River, as well as fluctuating water levels. Um, and so you can see here uh, that they, they do a fall drawdown every year. Um, Parks Canada does a fall drawdown. It's a little lower than it should be this time of year, just because we haven't had much rain and we didn't have much uh, much snowpack this year. Um, that's my wife for scale, so you can see it's like many many feet uh, low. Again, that's that's part of the, that wall that fall uh, drawdown process. Um, but if we have then further lower water levels for this time of year, um, because of a lack of, of rain and uh, and snowpack, that's also concerning. So uh, right now uh, I've talked enough. I am going to turn it over to uh, Jordana Bergman, who is part of the, um, uh, part of Dr. Stephen Cook's lab and uh, is uh, is the PhD student that is spearheading this, this project. And she's She's the one doing all the heavy lifting, uh, and uh, we're happy to have her on Team Best Fish. Uh, so take it away, Jordana. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Sean did a really great job of covering a lot of the key issues, um, so we can kind of go through the introduction. Uh, quickly, but um, essentially, my PhD thesis is looking at the ecological connectivity in the Rideau Canal as experienced by both invasive and native fish species. And our goal really is to see if we can develop um, strategies that support our native fish while minimizing invasive fish species. Um, I want to acknowledge first, whenever you do research like this, it's massively collaborative. So um, like Sean mentioned, even though I might be the one that's organizing and I'm out there in the field, I've had so much help from other folks. There's been so many musky anglers that have come out and help us catch fish and let us know great sites. Um, and my two advisors, Steve Cook and Joseph Bennett have been a huge help in helping direct this. Um, if you guys were listening last night, uh, Steve Cook talked a little bit uh, the doom and gloom of freshwater ecosystems. Um, but before I came to Canada, I was in, I mostly worked in the marine environment, and then I decided to switch over to freshwater because um, if you look at this graph on the right-hand side, 
the extinction rates that are happening in freshwater ecosystems are occurring faster compared to terrestrial and marine. So there's a lot of threats and issues that are occurring in freshwater ecosystems driving these extinction rates. And the WWF has listed these five main ones that you can go to the next slide. Uh, that could be driving them. And that includes, Sean has talked about these with habitat degradation or loss, species exploitation, invasive species pollution and climate change. Now we are in North America and that's where our research is. Do you wanna go to the next slide? Yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so we are curious about fish. That's what we're researching. So if we focus in on fish, the main uh, driver of extinction rates with fish is habitat degradation and loss. Click. Uh, but tied pretty closely in second uh, is exploitation and invasive species, which is what Sean mentioned before. So just keeping that all in mind. And um, click. Please let me introduce you to my study system. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Rideau Canal Waterway is located in eastern Ontario in Canada, just above Lake Ontario, but it is connected. To Lake Ontario. Uh, next slide. So the Rideau Canal is a 202 kilometer long system that connects Lake Ontario to the Ottawa River and um, it's connected by 23 working lock stations and when this canal was constructed in the 1830s they actually connected previously disconnected habitats um, and normally from a conservation standpoint we think about increased connectivity as a good thing. It means that there's more habitat available for our native species gene flow, spawning, normally we think of it as a good thing. But when we connected these uh, habitats, we also provided new pathways and new connections for invasive species. Um, now we know, uh, click, we know that there are fish in the Rideau Canal, uh, native and invasive species that make spawning migrations within the freshwater systems. Uh, they might try to move upstream to spawn and then come back down once they're done spawning. Next. Um, but there's a good chance that these fish are hitting anthropogenic barriers like the locks and dams uh, and they're not able to move up into these areas that they would need to to carry out their life history. There's also a chance though that we could use those barriers to our advantage and exploit invasive species. So if we knew when different fish species were trying to move throughout the canal, we could potentially alter the infrastructure or operations to minimize invasive species movements while still allowing native species. Um, but we can't do any of that until we know where fish are going and when, and to date, nobody has done this. Um, and there are a lot of different invasive species in the Rideau Canal across different taxa. You have zebra mussels, you have plant invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil, you have common carp. And then like Sean mentioned most recently, um, two years ago in January of 2019, um, a consulting company was doing some infrastructure work on a lock station near Smith Falls and they discovered 17 round gobies. Um, and that was the first time anybody knew about round gobies in the uh, Rideau Canal. They hadn't been um, mentioned anywhere. So we know that they were introduced then. Um, and ideally we can, use to, uh, we can use different tools to track these fish movements and then determine where they're going to develop those strategies. Um, so we are using acoustic telemetry as our tool for tracking fish movements. Um, now, in the there's essentially two components of acoustic telemetry for any of those who are not familiar with it. Um, the first part is the acoustic tags. So that's in the upper left-hand corner. And you'll notice there's two different sizes. Um, so we put size-specific tags into fish. You know, we don't want to put tags that are too big into fish that are small. So we make sure that it's not having a negative impact on their behavior or their physiology. The smaller tag on the left-hand side, that will last for about three years and we can put them in a uh, pretty small fish, like seven, eight inches. The tag on the right-hand side, I will put that into fish as small as 15 inches and those will last though up to nine years, which is uh, pretty massive. This is a relatively new development in acoustic telemetry and tracking a fish for nine years over its life can tell us a lot about where animals are moving from the, you know, the sub-adult phase all the way until they're sexually mature when they're adults. So it gives us an idea of if animals are using different habitats throughout their uh, lifetime. Um, yeah, next. So 
I am working with Steve and Sean um, to track five different fish species in the Rideau Canal. We have two invasive species, and that's what you see in the top circled in red, um, 45 round gobies and 54 common carp. Um, and then we're tracking three different native species, northern pike, largemouth bass, and muskie. Um, and we have a pretty awesome number of them. We have almost 300 tagged. <clears throat> the second part of tracking fish, so now we have surgically implanted these tags into their body cavity, and those tags put off a ping, a signal, um, and then we deploy these acoustic receivers, and that's what you see here on the bottom left-hand side. They kind of look like tall wine bottles. Um, those are essentially listening stations, so if a tagged fish swims by a receiver, then that receiver will store that information, and then when we retrieve the receiver, we can plot out where fish have been swimming and when. Um, so most of my work is in the Smith Falls Rideau Lakes area, um, and that's where we're tracking carp, brown gobies, largemouth bass, and northern pike. Um, but just north of that in, is um, where, so muskies aren't really found uh, mostly in these, I don't know about many folks who find, who catch muskie in the Rideau Lakes or Smith Falls area, but just north of it, um, once you get to like Merrickville and up through Kempville and then through to Ottawa, that's where uh, from what I understand, muskies are found. You can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, this is what our receiver uh, array would look like. So um, I have about 80 receivers in that area, and that's what each of those little blue dots is. So you won't see them. I stationed them on the bottom of the waterway, um, <clears throat> and they're just sitting there listening, waiting for fish to swim by them. And then we can understand, we can figure out where fish are swimming and when, when do they pass through locks, do they pass through locks? Um, and if they're seasonal movements, you can go to the next one. Um, but because muskies aren't found in that area, we developed and deployed a different acoustic array up near Ottawa. And we chose this area also because, like Sean had mentioned, it, it experiences these massive water drawdowns. So um, it was a good place to look at and see how these water drawdowns might be impacting fish movements. Um, so in this area right now, we have 13 receivers out, and those are mostly in the main part of the Rideau array. And we had developed and uh, deployed this array to look at overwintering, which I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, later. But it's essentially in between these two um, lock stations, the Long Island Lock and Black Rapids Lock. Okay, so uh, the first project that we're doing with uh, the first musky project that we're doing is this overwintering case study. And we did, we partnered up with Muskies Canada. Uh, last fall, I had such a great time having all the anglers come out. This was my first time musky fishing. To, this was my first time successfully musky fishing. And it was a blast. It was awesome. Um, I'm definitely team freshwater now. You guys converted me. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> these musky are experiencing three main threats. And these are the same ones that Sean mentioned. But uh, round goby are not too far away, so by understanding all these fish movements, hopefully we can prevent um, them from, you know, moving up to Ottawa further, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in this area especially, there's so much development going on. Like Sean mentioned, there could be lots of sediment running off, different pollutants coming from the city. But this area experiences such a serious water drawdown in the fall of almost 10, 11 feet. Um, and most of that reach is, is relatively shallow. Um, like the deepest pockets are maybe 25, 30 feet tops. So by lowering, the most of the areas are 15, 10, 15 deep. So by lowering the water level by 10 feet, you're really, you're removing a lot of habitat that fish can overwinter. Um, so that was why, yeah, and this is the Rideau Canal, it just screams Rideau Canal. Um, so that was why, you know, we wanted to make sure we did this first and foremost, get this project out. And if we can determine where fish are spending their winters, what, which one of these pools, because there's not that many in this part of the Rideau, then it'll provide us with the evidence that we would need to inform conservation actions. And that's um, something you'll hear in conservation science is evidence-based conservation actions, where we can give them now the data, the results that say, look, this is where fish are, please make sure that you know, we're protecting these few areas because if these muskies don't have anywhere to overwinter, then that's going to hugely impact their populations. Um, so right now, that's the first project that we have, um, but we do want to look at overall space use and seasonal movement patterns. So um, this summer and this spring, because the water levels are so low, we want to look at where fish are spawning, but we are having a tough time because 
um, a lot of the tributaries that we think they might be using are quite low, like they're only, you know, a foot deep. So we're looking at different options and thinking about ways that we can track fish movements. Um, looking at general connectivity, so I will be putting uh, receivers on either side of the lock station so we can see if fish are moving through the locks, when are they moving through locks, um, and yeah, are they moving up and down that main Rideau River channel or do they use the tributaries? And then I had mentioned earlier with the different tag sizes, um, <clears throat> we have pretty small fish tagged and we also have adults tagged and because we can track them for so many years, it'll be really cool I mean, interesting to see how how and if they use different habitats throughout their life. So that'll be something interesting that we will be looking at over time. And there might be one more bullet. Oh, results, stay tuned. Yeah, so this is a, it's essentially a monitoring study. So we do have this one overwintering project that, you know, took six months. We'll analyze the data, we'll get it out, we'll share it with partners and decision makers. But um, this will be, this kind of work will be ongoing for years, which, um, makes a really cool, robust data sets. Um, and I'm gonna briefly go back to the round goby stuff. Mm. I think a lot of you guys are interested in how round gobies might be impacting um, <clears throat> fish and where they are because this is relatively new. So I wanted to bring this up and share um, our research with you. Um, so yeah, the muskie distribution is, is really just a handful of log stations away from where the round gobies were discovered in Smith Falls. And uh, unfortunately, when invasive species are introduced to a system, uh, your chances at eradicating them are slim to none. It's almost a waste of uh, financial and uh, personal effort. But there are about 60% of studies suggest that you, if you, you know, if you catch it at the beginning of the invasion front and you find a way to control that population, then you might have a good chance of minimizing their dispersal and just kind of keeping them to that one area. So with that in mind, knowing that they've probably only been here for a handful of years because nobody else has reported them anywhere, um, we went out and we used a backpack electrofisher. So we kind of looked like Ghostbusters. We had this big backpack on and then a wand that would generate, generate just enough electricity to stun the fish but not kill them. We collected about 60 round gobies and then we took a ton of different measurements you know, we measured their head width, their body width, how long they were, we identified sex, and using all that information, we could backtrack and generate the age of the invasion front and figure out how long they might be here. Um, so we took all that information and then I made sure to photograph them just so that we could indeed confirm that they were around gobies. Um, I did euthanize about 10 of them because they were too small to acoustically tag and um, I donated them to the Canadian Museum of Nature. So they have voucher specimens uh, and they're doing genetic work to see if they can determine where these round gobies were introduced from. So that should be cool to find out. Um, and we conducted, so this is a totally different uh, telemetry tag. These are very, very tiny. Uh, and Steve had talked about this last night. Um, they're about half the size of a red kidney bean. So uh, round gobies are, are very small. So we uh, conducted very tiny um, acoustic telemetry surgeries. Um, and we put those into the fish. And this is kind of what this kind of surgery would look like, um, just to give you a scale. And this is one of the bigger round gobies. So it's very different than working on, you know, these 40 inch musky. I had to flip entirely and do tiny, tiny surgeries. Um, and this is um, the round goby array. Now the array does span out like you saw in that other photo with all the blue dots. Um, but this is mostly where round gobies were detected. They, round gobies really prefer like rocky riprap habitat. And there was a lot of that kind of habitat up near the Edmonds Dam. And that's where you see the yellow circle that says site of capture. So we captured the gobies there. I would take them to shore and do my tiny surgery. And then we released them all at a single site of release just downstream of the Edmonds Lock Station. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. We wanted to make sure that we had an initial point from which I could track them from because they're so tiny and they can hide. And sometimes it's hard to detect signals when the fish is hiding under a rock. So we just, we released them right on that receiver. Um, and we also wanted to see how far they disperse in that three month window that we were tracking them. And we also wanted to know if they were moving through locks because that is, that'll be hugely important in how we manage them if, if we can determine if they use the locks as a pathway. Um, and our preliminary studies suggest that most of them don't move too much. Uh, 
three fourths of them just kind of hung out near the site of release for the entire time that they were detected. Um, but a quarter of them did leave that area. And some of them went back to their site of capture. They went up to the dam, maybe because that's where the best habitat is. Um, but the farthest a single individ individual um, moved in that three month period was 500 meters. Um, and that could be because just downstream, there's a really large weedy lake um, and, and heavy weeds and muck are not great habitat for gobies. So it could just, that could be acting as some sort of a natural barrier. But uh, more importantly, uh, was that nine of them did enter the lock. So these gobies um, were detected on the upstream side of the lock. We confirmed that they were indeed in there. But what was really important, and this was probably our most important part of the paper, is that none of, there was no true upstream dispersal. So that was good news. Um, and what do I mean by dispersal? So if I focus in on that telemetry array that's right inside of the lock, um, you'll notice that there is each blue dot is a receiver. So we had acoustic receivers right inside that lock station. And then I would put a receiver just on the upstream and downstream side so we could see when fish were entering and exiting. Um, and a fish did exit the lock. Uh, one of them did, and it was detected for about 15 minutes on that receiver that circled in red. But then after that 15 minute period, there was a lockage from upstream to downstream where a boat entered the lock from the upstream to downstream direction. And during that time, that round goby re-entered the lock and then was not detected upstream again. So it left, but then it popped back in, which was great, good, good to know at least. Um, and there was no size or sex specific movements. So as of now, everybody seems to be moving without anything that's driving those movements. Um, so we wanted to know how are gobies entering the lock because knowing exactly how they're doing it will better inform any management actions. Uh, and this is where collaborations really come into play. And um, so we partnered up with hydraulic modeling, um, sorry, we, we partnered up with hydraulic engineers and they produced these incredible 3D models. And because more than half of the gobies were entering through the gates at night, um, we were able to determine that the lock masters are actually leaving these sluice valves on the gates open at night. And that's how gobies are entering. And they have to leave them open because they needed water levels in the lock to stay low. Um, apparently, if they leave the, wa the water levels high, then people think it's a big swimming pool and go swimming in there. So they keep the water levels low for safety purposes. But to do that, because the upstream side gates leak, they leave these sluice valves open. So because we know how they're entering now, you know, we can suggest different ways to prevent fish from entering at night. Um, and for the goby that exited on the upstream side, um, this was really important where hydraulic engineers came into play. So these hydraulic engineers had installed water level loggers inside the lock chamber so they could tell us the depth that was inside at all times and the depth would often correlate to lockages. So we were able to determine that the lockmasters had the water level high and the upstream side gates were open for almost an hour. They just left them open. Um, it's usually because it's just easier for them to leave it open if they know a boat is coming. So they left those gates open though for 60 minutes. And during that 60 minute period, at the very end of that hour is when that goby left. So had that gate been closed, it's likely that the fish wouldn't have exited the gate altogether. Um, and then when they conducted that lockage where a boat did enter through the upstream gates to be locked downstream, the fish either entered in through the sluice tunnels like you see in the yellow, um, that's what the yellow part of this 3D model is. The fish might've just been sucked in through the sluice tunnels or it re-entered in through those gates during the lockage. Um, so we know that, and we know that um, managers are usually more responsive when you give them really simple and powerful, but clear management recommendations. We don't make it super complex or financially difficult. So we have two really easy ways that we can prevent gobies from dispersing. Uh, the first one is to close those gates, just close them. It, it's gonna be more work for lockmasters because that means even if they know a boat is coming in an hour, you need to close the gates. Um, but it could prevent you know those fish from moving and also to close those gates at night. Um, because logistically that might they might not wanna do that to keep water levels low, we could work with different engineers to put some kind of a mesh over it or a barrier. Maybe we could have a spillover dam or a spillover like a little bit higher up. Uh, gobies are benthic. 
So they stay on the bottom. Um, they don't they don't usually swim up into the water column. So as long as we raised up those sluice valves, then we could prevent gobies from entirely entering the lock at all at night. Um, and yeah, we do need to act quickly. Um, so this is year two into the project and because of COVID things were delayed, but um, I'm hoping by this season we can implement some kind of pro-conservation behavior change with the lock masters and minimize this population from spreading further, especially because you know, muskies are just a few kilometers away. Um, so yeah, we're working on writing it all up. And other than a scientific article, I'd really like to put out something that is like simple, clear, short, easy to read that I can share with groups like you guys and lake organizations. Um, and we're working with Parks Canada. They are a partner on this project. So at least it's nice to know that they're right there supporting it. Um, our plan is to tag at least 10 more muskie in June. So if there's anybody that is willing or excited to come out and help fish with us, um, feel free to email me and I'm going to send folks out an email come June. Um, it will be dependent on shutdown because Carleton is pretty strict on our COVID protocols. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then, yeah, we're really excited to keep continuing these different aspects of muskie research, looking at sub-adult and adult movements, um, <clears throat> seeing where they're spawning and general connectivity. Um, thank you everybody again for listening in. Uh, Sean and I are happy to take questions. Um, yeah, not, feel free to email us. Yeah, uh, feel free to email either Jordana or, or myself um, if you have any questions. We have just a couple of minutes and I just wanted to sort of end by saying um, everything is interconnected, right? So, you know, I know we all love to hear about musky stuff, but, we're, you know, as Dr. Cook said yesterday, muskies are kind of and what we do to help help promote their their conservation muskies are kind of an umbrella species so you know especially when we're like focusing on habitat work um, that habitat helps all the other fish species that also need to use that habitat well all those other fish species then form you know the the basis of the food chain for muskies and so you know the stuff that jordan is doing now is it's like with gobies you know gobies the Rito connects to the Ottawa River, very famous system, has no gobies in it. It, you know, it's entirely possible that gobies might get in there at some point in the future, unless we can figure out how to stop them from getting in there. And so by Jordana doing the work she's doing right now to study their movement, how they're interacting with these lock structures that are really kind of one of the one of the most important ways we might be able to stop them from spreading downstream. Uh, you know, that kind of work may have some benefit for uh, populations of muskies within the Rito system, as well as potentially within the, uh, the Ottawa River. So you know, everything is all interconnected. And as much as we love to study uh, muskies, you know, it is also important to consider some of those other species and, and, uh, uh, and habitats within the systems that we work in. So um, yeah, this is all great work. Jordan is doing a great job. Uh, she's super jazzed about muskies, which uh, is really refreshing to see because there are sometimes people that are, you know, especially students and researchers that bang their heads against the wall because it is kind of difficult to work with muskies because they are so rare. But um, yeah, thanks for everyone, uh, everyone's attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. And I think we'll turn it over to Danny now so you can run some more, uh, some more giveaways here. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you so, so much. That was an awesome presentation. I love the details, the planning. And uh, one of the best parts, I think, is you're you're being active. You're being proactive, not reactive. We're trying to solve a problem before it gets to be a, a bigger or worse problem. Um, so thank you for the work you're doing, because we're seeing on the St. Lawrence right now um, what can happen if there is no control measures in place. And if you guys can save uh, even one section or one fishery, then uh, all your work here is is worth its weight in gold so thank you and the presentation was uh w was terrific very very well done i tell you you've done it a hundred times instead of just two um <laughs> one uh one last thing i apologize on behalf of uh musky anglers everywhere um whoever introduced you to them and got you addicted you should not be friends with them anymore it is a <laughs> mean cruel and expensive sport uh if you have any desires to like own property or retire they're gone now that's all done so um anyways uh i don't think you will have a difficult time finding anglers to come out and help you with that uh please let me know if for some crazy reason you haven't figured that part out yet um the muskie trader canada group has 4,300 people 
confident we can get a couple up there for you um, at a, at a moment's notice. Even if social distancing is an issue, we could probably figure something out or, yeah. along those lines. Uh, let us know. Let me know, and I'll do my best to help you. So thank you again. Cool. Thanks, Danny.